Hello ladies and gentlemen, we are back for a new review. This time we're putting the Mega Man X games aside for a bit so I can talk about Metal Gear 2, Solid Snake for the MSX2 as well as Snake's Revenge on the NES. A few months ago I did a review of Metal Gear 1 for the MSX and NES. In that video I basically said that I thought the MSX version was a pretty good game. That is far more than worth your time. And I think the NES version speaks for itself in regard to how bad it was. So no need to spend too much time on that game since I haven't played it since and have no plans to do so anytime soon. As unfaithful and poorly constructed as it was, the NES version was a pretty huge success in North America, and so Konami had the developers of Metal Gear 1 NES make a sequel exclusive to those markets, and the final product being Snake's Revenge. Why it's called Revenge, I have no idea, honestly. You could really stretch and say it's Naked Snake's Revenge, but I doubt Big Boss even had a backstory at this point in the series anyway, so not worth talking about. More importantly, is Snake's Revenge better than the NES original? Let's find out. Story-wise, the West has received word that an enemy nation has found out the plans for the destroyed Metal Gear that got destroyed off-camera on the NES game and are now constructing Metal Gear 2. Not the game, a uh, mech called Metal Gear 2. Lieutenant Solid Snake has been chosen for another mission titled Operation 747, and Snake is accompanied by John Turner, a former Navy agent, and Nick Meyer, a weapons and explosives expert. Throughout the game, these partners don't add much to the game other than some betrayals, and then Big Boss comes back as a cyborg, and Snake defeats him and destroys Metal Gear 2, ending the game. Ultimately, I can't say I was looking for a good story in a Metal Gear NES game, so it gets the job done, but not much else. But I don't really care about that, what matters more is the game design. Snake's Revenge plays like the first game with more or less the same control scheme. Snake can have both a gun and a knife equipped, or a fist equipped if you want to do some kills without making noise since your gun doesn't come with a suppressor, that has to be found later. Let me not waste your time, this game sucks. Like, really badly. I can keep this pretty brief. Remember in the last Metal Gear review where I told you that the checkpoint system in the NES game was garbage and you had to go back incredibly far just to correct one mistake? This game does all of that again. The awful checkpoint system, or the one thing I didn't mention last time but is bad in both games, is that the NES controller had a limited amount of buttons, so item management is a colossal pain since it's not clear what does what, and in between menus the controls change. The first area has several searchlights to hide from, and it's infuriating since it's so easy to get caught and incredibly easy to die, and dying once with one star means that your ass is going right back to the beginning of the game, or luckily, the beginning of the building. Sometimes the game is incredibly unclear as to what you can and can't sneak past, leading to detection or death. Doesn't help that the enemies have more mobility than you do, seeing as I can only shoot in four directions, but they can apparently shoot in all eight. I hear that this game has 2D sections and even more BS moments than what I've already discussed, but I'll be honest. I didn't even get that far. This game is miserable, and so is the previous NES game. Both are the two worst Metal Gear games I have ever played. And no, I really don't care whether or not Hideo Kojima's name was on it. It is rather noteworthy that he hates both of these games, but that doesn't mean that they were doomed from the start. The difficulty is just through the roof, and other problems certainly don't help. The point is, I think some people will have a bias against any Metal Gear game that wasn't directed by Kojima, but to be frank, if Snake's Revenge was the best game of all time, I'd be right here telling you it was the best game of all time. Ultimately, it was the game design that makes me hate these games, not their status in the canon or who directed them or any of that crap. With that said, these two games are pretty much the reason we have the Metal Gear series we know and love today. What do I mean by this? Well, like I said, Konami felt that the success of Metal Gear 1 in North America was worth making a sequel. But back overseas in Japan, Hideo Kojima and a friend were on a bus ride. He mentioned Snake's Revenge, to which Kojima felt the need to make his own MSX sequel. So I hate these games. But without them, would Metal Gear continue on to be what it is today? Who knows really, just some food for thought. However, I figured all that would make for a smooth transition into the actual topic of today's video, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. In the very late 20th century, the Cold War is coming to an end, because by the way, the game came out in 1990 and takes place in 1999, and so in the game, the Cold War is still going on, despite the fact that it actually ended before that. The entire world has abandoned their nukes, but unfortunately, an armed nation known as Zanzibar Land emerges with, you guessed it, nuclear weapons. The world is running short on oil, and so a scientist by the name of Dr. Keo Marv has developed Oilix, a creation to solve the problem, but he was captured and brought to Zanzibar Land along with the plans for Oilix. So Special Forces Unit Foxhound has dragged Solid Snake out of retirement. I didn't mention it last time, but I'll mention it now. After killing countless people and escaping by the skin of his teeth after the Outer Heaven Uprising, Snake was noticeably shaken by it and retired. Foxhound is no longer under the command of Big Boss, but instead Colonel Roy Campbell, who should be familiar to any fans of the Solid series. Colonel Campbell requests that Snake infiltrate Zanzibar Land, rescue Dr. Keo Marv, and recover Oilix, and destroy the nuclear weapons. The obligatory spoiler warning being now, 
Snake makes his way through the base, all the while meeting a diverse radio cast, including familiar faces like Master Benedict Kazuhira McDonald Miller, seriously, they cannot decide what this guy's name is, as well as a secret agent, Holly White, who infiltrated Zanzibar land before Snake did, and is helping him find Dr. Marv. Along the way, Snake meets a cyborg ninja, who upon defeating him turns out to be Kyle Schneider, the guy who helped you find hidden secrets in Outer Heaven. Why is he a cyborg ninja? Get ready for this. After Snake destroyed Metal Gear TX-55 in the last game, that huge explosion wasn't just the self-destruct sequence, but it was also NATO arriving on the scene to wipe Outer Heaven out of existence with all the soldiers, hostages, and even children, who were apparently in Outer Heaven even though they never appeared, still inside. They were either killed or badly injured from it with no remorse. I really like this twist, seeing as it puts Snake's actions into perspective. It was Snake's mission to destroy Metal Gear, but after the fact, the place was bombed, like I said. But is there anyone to blame? I mean, Big Boss intended for Operation Intrude N313 to be a weak suicide mission, and Snake was better than anyone expected, like I established last time. Should Snake have destroyed Metal Gear? Well, it could have led to a catastrophe if he hadn't, so yes. But all those lives were taken as a result of it. But many more lives would be taken if he didn't destroy Metal Gear, so it's up to interpretation. With that said, Kyle Schneider dies, and Snake must continue the mission. Schneider told Snake how to find Marv, but instead he finds Dr. Madnar, the creator of Metal Gear TX-55, who was also kidnapped in Zanzibar. Here, Snake finds out that the leader of Zanzibar is the one and only Big Boss, who survived being shot in the head several times with the rocket launcher and being blown up in outer heaven. But to be fair, in Metal Gear 1, it was revealed in the end as an end credits twist that he was still alive. Except, oh wait, that wasn't Big Boss at all. Snake then finds Holly, who helps him find Mars radio frequency, but the problem is he doesn't speak any English, and now Snake needs to find a female spy who's disguised as a Zanzibar guard, and she can translate what Marv says. Her name being Gustava Hefner. Snake finds her in the woman's bathroom, and that's where the path to Dr. Madnar is, and so the two of them find Madnar so they can find Marv. But Madnar goes away for a second, so Snake and Gustava have a chat about their past. Snake, as usual, says he doesn't have a family or a past worth talking about, and Gustava opens up about her origins as a former Olympic skater, and that she had a lover named Frank, and when the two wanted to go across the border, she wasn't accepted, and so they were separated. Despite not having any voice acting, this scene is actually really sad given how Gustava is a likable character and it's unfortunate to hear that she had such a difficult past. Madnar comes back and they almost make it to Zanzibar Land Building 3, but when Madnar makes it across the bridge, Gustava makes it halfway, but right then and there, a brand new Metal Gear named Metal Gear D arrives on the scene and blows Gustava to bits. This is also a really impactful scene since like I just said, we were told all that stuff about her past and she just met a brutal land from the one and only Grey Fox, who is the pilot of Metal Gear D. He warns Snake to get out and takes Madnar hostage, but Snake infiltrates anyway despite the warnings to find Madnar and Marv. But Marv is already dead, and Holly reveals that Madnar killed him, to which Madnar explains that Metal Gear was his greatest project, and that the US didn't take him seriously as a scientist. And so, he has decided to make a new Metal Gear to suppress TX-55 to aid Big Boss. Snake kills him, but before that he reveals Metal Gear D's weakness. Although I'm not quite sure I get his character motivation, seeing as he willingly built Metal Gear D, but he just said what its weakness was. Whatever. Snake destroys Metal Gear D and gets into a fist fight with Grey Fox and defeats him. But he finds out that Grey Fox's real name is Frank Yeager and that he was Gustavo's lover and he unknowingly killed her himself, which is quite tragic. The mission isn't over yet because Snake still has to finish off Big Boss, who explains to him why he continues to fight and why he recruits children. Mainly because the world is going soft in his eyes, so he is taking the children away at a young age and making them soldiers to fight in the next Great War. But Snake doesn't want to hear any of it and wants to destroy Big Boss to remove him from his life for good. Snake lights Big Boss on fire, and he reveals that he's Snake's father. Oh wait, except, no he doesn't. Seriously, these games have been retconned to hell and back, like no joke. Apparently Big Boss was supposed to tell Snake they were father and son, but that didn't happen in the game, so I'll talk more in depth about that in the Metal Gear Solid review, but still. You'd think these games getting retranslated after Metal Gear Solid 3 came out would make them rewrite the games to reflect this stuff, but I guess not. Finally, Snake recovers Oilix, and he alongside Holly escape in time for Christmas dinner, because this game takes place on Christmas Eve, by the way. In the end, the world's oil crisis is coming to an end, and the day is saved, and the future is looking bright for the world. Except, no it isn't. The story in this game is excellent. I thought that the story in Metal Gear 1 was really good, but most of the plot in that game takes place outside of the plot. This game, however, shows all the important information within the game. The story itself might not be the best there's ever been in video game history, but I have to remind you that this is an 8-bit computer game from 1990. The standard of the time was some kind of call to action, whether it be a princess getting captured or the villain comes to threaten everyone, you take it upon yourself to do something, and then the game begins. This game stops to develop the characters, whether it be through long monologues or two-way conversations. This game is where Hideo Kojima's writing style really started to flourish, since the villains in Metal Gear 1 ultimately had no character to them at all, but in this game, like I said, when they die, the bosses usually give a monologue explaining things. Solid Snake himself is much more of a character in this game. In the last game, he was pretty much silent for most of it, but in this game, he's the same Snake you remember from the Solid series, only without the voice acting. 
Take the fight with the Running Man, for example. Upon defeat, he gives a monologue, and Snake says, Guess you weren't fast enough. Or how Snake talks about how he doesn't have a family or a past worth explaining, like I said earlier. The game has a strong anti-war message to it, with the talks of child soldiers, or how war has an effect on soldiers through PTSD, or how Gustavo explains how her mother in World War II had to hide in the sewers from Nazis. The point here being how it's interesting because this game was only released in Japan, and so eight years later Metal Gear Solid came out and was called a pioneer of game design and storytelling for doing all the same things that were done eight years prior in this game. However, the continuity in this game is an issue. But I'll discuss that way more in depth in the Metal Gear Solid review with some more details soon. That pretty much covers the story of Metal Gear 2, and with that, let's dive into the gameplay. Metal Gear 2 is the peak of the 2D Metal Gear gameplay, keeping in mind that I never played the Game Boy Color game. I recently went back to Metal Gear 1 on MSX and made it about a quarter of the way through the game. And I can say my stance on it now is still how I felt back when I did the review. It's a pretty good game, but it wasn't perfect for several reasons. In terms of things Metal Gear 1 did better, Snake can't run and shoot in this game, which was immensely useful in the last game. It wasn't a big deal, but having to be stopped dead in your tracks and shoot can be irksome. A major addition is that Snake can crawl, which helps with stealth since you can crawl under tables, through events, under trucks, or over mines, which means that it's instantly added to your inventory. Right when the game begins, Campbell tells Snake about his new radar system, since the game plays on a grid system, with you being on one grid, and the radar displays what's happening on nine grids, so you can play around the guards. However, it is really easy to get caught in this game. The guards now have a 45 degree field of vision, so don't expect the guards to be as stupid as before. The environment can also reveal Snake's location, such as wooden floors or surfaces that make sound effects when stepped on. Killing every guard won't end in alert phase though, because you actually have to hide this time around. And while you're hiding, the alert phase will end, and with that, the evasion state will begin, with the guards being on high alert looking for you. Honestly though, in terms of gameplay and controls, it's the same thing as the last game, with another change being how the hostage and star system is gone, your maximum health increases after each boss is defeated, which after playing Snake's Revenge, I can tell you I am beyond glad that this game took that out. In addition to that, every now and again there's a mini load time in between areas, and while it might get old to see these, it serves as a respawn point, which removes the lengthy backtracking after dying in the last three games, more specifically the last two, but that is a huge convenience. The inventory has changed slightly though. Not only really in terms of weapons, since a lot of them are the same, only looking different. Like how in Metal Gear 1 we had a grenade launcher, but in this game we have grenades that do the same thing. A lot of the items are the same too, such as the cardboard box, or the rations, of which there are three separate kinds of different flavors, but all three refill your health to max, so they're all useful. But they do have their individual uses, like how the chocolate one makes acid turned into solid ground. Another thing worth noting is how, in the last game, if you left a truck and then walked back in and there was a ration inside, it would keep respawning over and over and over again, so you could grind for rations there. But in this game, that's been taken out, so you have to be more tactical about your ration usage. Key cards are still a part of this game, and guess what? They're just as bad as before. Card 9 opens card 9 doors, but not card 1 doors. However, this game makes a change in the form of the colored cards. The first one's taking the place of cards 1 through 3, and the second is cards 4 through 6, and the last one is 7 through 9. So this limits how many cards you have to switch through, but it still shouldn't be like this to begin with. It should be that once you get card 4, every door that opens with cards 1 through 4 should just automatically open, which I can't believe it took 4 games to figure out, or how it just took 5 games to get rid of this crap. Speaking of crap, Metal Gear 2 has a lot of that. I have noticed it getting better on multiple playthroughs, but that doesn't change the fact that it still exists. First being how Snake must follow this Green Beret guy through the woods to find Dr. Madnar, and it's ridiculous since you can't just go there yourself because the game won't let you, and getting caught once means you're doing it all over again. The timing is really strict too, since when he went in a circle back to where he started halfway through, I gave it a second before following him, and somehow that meant I failed when I could do that before. After that mess, the player must make their way through a swamp with an invisible path being presented to you. How do you know what's safe and what's not? You don't. It's the absolute definition of trial and error. And once you fall into the mud, it takes such a long time to crawl back out. It is ridiculously horrendous. Especially since you have to go through it more than once. At minimum twice, since you have to go through it to get to the boss fight with the running man, and then back out to go through it again to get back to where you were going. However, I've saved the worst of my issues with Metal Gear 2 for last. And that would be the god-awful backtracking. This game has to do so many little backtracks here and there to be annoying, but I mean the big ones, like how when the bridge to the building 3 is blown up, Snake has to make his way all the way back to building 1 just to get the hand glider so we can go back up to building 2 and get chased up a million flights of stairs by never-ending guards because the elevator stopped working due to an ambush from guards. Wait, that sounded pretty familiar come to think of it. You know what else? I noticed how a mysterious guy from the shadows warns you of danger from ahead who calls himself your biggest fan who turns out to be Grey Fox. Or how Snake gets Gustavo's brooch which he needs to freeze and heat up in select areas to do something really important. Just saying these won't be the last time these things happen. 
That freezing the brooch thing I just talked about was by far the worst one. Since you need it to get to the Oilix cartridge, but you need to go all the way from the end of building 3, all the way back to building 1 just to freeze the brooch which morphs into a key to get the cartridge. Yes, there are shortcuts, in fact that's the only way to get from building 3 to 2, but it's such an ungodly waste of time. But I think the stupidest one has got to be one how beating this guy he drops the 8th card and how according to the number 1 fan he also has the ninth card too, but he says that like 20 minutes later. And you need the ninth card to progress, obviously, and you have to go all the way back to that arena just to get it. And it's in the same spot every time. And so after I beat him the first time, I looked around for it and it just plain wasn't there. The game is forcing you to backtrack in an instance that could have been turned into cool replay value if you could get the card ahead of time. The boss fights, I'm afraid to say, aren't much better than the last time. These guys have more character to them than the goon squad from the last game, but they just don't really have much going for them as bosses, seeing as many of them can still be beaten by shooting them in the face a few times and calling it a day. Like, take this invisible guy, for example. I know they were going for something as grand as Vulcan Raven or the end. Since you can't see him, but you can hear him walking, but at the same time, you have to be as quiet as possible so he doesn't hear and see you. But you can beat him right at the beginning by shooting him in the face a few times. One thing I do love is the atmosphere in Zanzibar Land. I don't know what it is, but the atmosphere here is on point, maybe because the environments are far more diverse and detailed than the last game. The intriguing storyline complementing it, or the great soundtrack. The soundtrack has far more variety in it since this game has several tracks in it for different scenarios, unlike the 8 tracks in the last game. I did notice that I found the soundtrack in Metal Gear 1 to be more memorable for me, probably because it recycles the same tracks repeatedly, but still Metal Gear 2's soundtrack is not too shabby. Another thing worth mentioning would be that when you talk to your allies on the radio, a thing they added in the translation is that the character portraits have been redrawn since in the original they were meant to be movie homages. But now they've been redone by Yoji Shinkawa, the art director of the Solid series, so that in Metal Gear 2's frequent radio chatter, the characters would match their appearances in the other games. But that pretty much covers Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. But one question I want to answer here is, do I enjoy this game more or less than the first game? Metal Gear 1, as I said, was a really enjoyable time from start to finish, but it still had its issues. But this game approves a lot on what I said the last game established. For example, I noticed how I found this game to be a lot more cryptic than the last one. The game does tell you what you need to do most of the time, but they don't do it nearly enough. This game by itself has plenty of its own other flaws though, like how the Green Beret sections the Swamp sections are just really annoying, or the backtracking. Both games are flawed products of their time that for the most part hold up that I'd recommend to any Metal Gear fan, but I still think I might rather replay the original Metal Gear due to its fun arcade feel. I think Metal Gear 2 is better designed than Metal Gear 1 for many reasons, but still, I figured I'd say that. In the last video, I talked about how Konami shut down the fan remake of Metal Gear 1, despite Konami giving it the green light in the first place. So now that Konami is having trouble with ideas for the next Metal Gear game, I was expecting, guaranteeing that Konami would take the obvious opportunity to remake Metal Gear 1 and 2 for modern consoles and therefore fix all the continuity problems that these games bring in if you play the rest of the series. It would bring in easy money and sell pretty well. Can you imagine exploring Outer Heaven or Zanzibar Land beautifully redone in the Fox Engine? Hell, after that, they could remake MGS 1 or 2 or 3 in the Fox Engine, and that's even easier money since they already have all the audio for it. Instead, we get Metal Gear Survive, which is not the topic of this video. I might buy that game, I might even be good, but overall, Metal Gear Survive is a poor way to follow up the controversial ending of Metal Gear Solid 5. Since Metal Gear 1 and 2 are right after Metal Gear Solid 5 in the timeline, it would make the most sense financially and for the fans. I know I would buy it day one at the very least. With that said, given the results of my recent Twitter poll, my next review will be Mega Man X4, followed by Mega Man Extreme 1 for the Game Boy Color. But I promise to not keep any Metal Gear fans waiting, since trust me guys, I will be reviewing Metal Gear Solid very soon. But it will not be the next video. With that said, thank you for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.
as if that wasn't bad enough, the world is running short on ego. Okay, eco, no. 